All right. Well, welcome everyone. I think people are starting to be able to pop in. So while we wait for more people to arrive, actually, I don't see any. Oh, now we start to see it. Yeah. Okay. All right, so we should give people a few minutes to get in. Sorry to start it late. Uh, let me get the welcome message going. And please feel free to, oh, how do I, ah, interesting. I can, Holly, I can only send chats to host and panelists. I cannot send chats to everyone. It should give you, is it not giving you an option under host and panelists to, it should say everyone under there. It did not, unfortunately. Because Mike and I are it not listed as co-hosts, so um, that is the problem. Once the interpretation, I think, is launched, then Mike can become host and we'll be able to share. Okay. Right. Yeah. It, yeah. So this is. So it should be working now. There you go, chat. Thank you, everybody, for joining. We're getting all the tech stuff set up. Oh, now I see everyone. Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the session. Uh, we're still waiting for people to join. So perhaps a minute or two. Um, and then we will get it going. Uh, feel free to. Leave do you, do your... you want me to share the welcome slides? Ah, good point. Yes, please. I can do it too. Oh, okay. Then you do it and I'll stop. Yes. Okay. There you go. There we go. And while we get the technicality going, uh, please feel free to uh, introduce yourself in the chat so that everyone can see who's in the session. And we will be going momentarily. Let's see. You attended the Insight Black Gallery during introduction. Do you want me to try uh, interpret what's on the, uh, oh, there you go. <laughs> so do we have the uh, Spanish channel enabled yet? No, not yet. I have to introduce, let people know how to get, get to it. Okay. Si, buenas tardes a todos los que están entrando ahorita aquí a la sesión. Uh, bienvenidos a esta cumbre de salud. Uh, si quieren escuchar la, esta sesión en español, pueden entrar al canal donde voy a estar interpretando en español a uh, todos simultáneamente. Además, todo lo que tienen que hacer es hacerle clic abajo a la barra que está abajo oscura. Va a salir un globito que dice español o inglés. Va a decir Spanish or English. Escojan español y ahí voy a estar yo en un canal traduciendo todo lo que están diciendo ellos. Uh, lo pueden hacer ahorita. Uh, gracias. Thank you, Juan. So, Carol, yes. we can go ahead and uh, start the translation channel now. Please let me know when we're ready to move into the session. I am still not able to add him. Let me try one more time.
English, Spanish, okay. It's not working. Holly, could you uh, lend us a hand? Yes, sorry about that. I am back. Uh, and I'll take care of it. Okay, interpretation is all set. We are good to go. All right. For those who need it, uh, please take a look at the instruction. And uh, again, welcome everyone to the breakout session where we're going to talk about the rare disease advisory council and everything you need to know. Um, uh, just uh, as we start, there is Spanish translation, as you have seen in the main session. So please go ahead and uh, hit that if you need it. I'm going to transition to our moderator, Siri Vais. Thank you very much, Mike. And I guess we can stop sharing those slides now. Is that true? Okay, great. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this breakout session, Rare Disease Advisory Council, Opportunities and Challenges for the Community. I'm Siri Vaith, Executive Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute, or CFRI. I am also the mother of an adult daughter who lives with cystic fibrosis, which we say CF for short which is a rare disease that impacts every organ system in the body, um, but is most known for causing progressive lung disease. I am also a member of the steering committee of a patient advocacy coalition working to create a rare disease advisory council in California to provide a voice for the rare disease community at the state level. It's estimated that one in 10 people in California is living with a rare disease. Um, and the technical definition for those of you who are wondering is a disease that impacts 200,000, less than 200,000 people in the, in the United States. And there are an estimated seven to 10,000 identified rare diseases. That is of course the key word identified, uh, many which impact literally just a handful of people. Individuals and their families coping with a rare disease have numerous challenges, including the diagnostic odyssey, lack of medical specialists, lack of FDA approved therapies. In fact, 95% of rare diseases have no FDA approved therapies. And for the lucky 5% who do have approved therapies, it's an issue with ch financial challenges to access them. So in light of this, there is a vital need for a rare disease advisory council in our state. And today we are going to hear from five individuals who have been working tirelessly to bring this to fruition. Anissa Reed, Mike Hu, Adrian Shapiro, Stacy Rivelas, and Jacob Fraker. Um, so again, you're all very savvy to this, but a reminder to everyone before we launch into the presentations to use the chat box to chat. <laughs> that is there for you. And to please use the Q&A box for the questions. It's just very helpful to have them uh, concentrated in one box. <clears throat> so with that, our first presenter today is Anissa Reed. Anissa is responsible for the development and implementation of the National Organization of Rare Disorders, aka NORDS, policy and advocacy efforts in support of the rare disease community at the state level. Anissa has a master's degree in public health and at Nord, she focuses on rare disease policy issues related to access to care and creating and implementing robust rare disease advisory councils. Welcome, Anissa. And I will share my screen. Perfect. Get the slides and start the slideshow. Oops, that is not. What just happened? Here we go. There. Everybody can see the slides? Yes. Perfect. Wonderful. Great. Thank you so much, Siri. So as mentioned, I'm Anissa Reed, and I'm with Nord. So I'm really excited today to share a little bit of an overview of the importance of rare disease advisory councils and some of the great work that we have seen them do throughout the country to support 
their state's rare disease community. Perfect, Next slide please. I apologize, it was not oh. advancing. So let me share one more time, and he sent all the straight to no slide. No problem, please. thank you. Perfect, there it is. Thank you so much. So I first wanted to briefly share a little bit of an overview of NORD um, and you know why we're involved in these efforts really. So NORD was established back in 1983 and was instrumental in the Orphan Drug Act, which created financial incentives for the development of treatments for rare diseases. So for 40 years, NORD, along with our 300 plus patient organization members, has led the way in voicing the needs of the rare disease community, driving supportive policies, advancing medical research, and providing patient and family services for those who need it the most. Thanks, okay, please. Perfect, so let's start with the problem. So more than 25 million Americans are living with the one of the more than 7,000 unique rare diseases. So this breaks down as mentioned to about one in 10 Americans. So even though that might seem like a lot, state decision makers still have limited awareness of the issues and impact that rare diseases have on patients, their caregivers, and the overall healthcare system. Okay. Slide, please. This is very frustrating. It is now once again not advancing. No worries. Let's no see. problem. I know that it can be tricky. And super frustrating. I can um, kind of dive in then. So to um, what the solution is to these issues. So um, we believe that it's to form rare disease advisory councils or RDACs for short. Um, where a diverse group of those in the rare disease community come together to advise state government about the unique challenges that com the community faces. So this is especially important as many healthcare decisions are made at the state level. So we see this as an enormous opportunity for the community and legislators to come together to partner in a more strategic way to address issues on a regular basis. Um, RDAX provide a strong platform for rare disease patients, families, and stakeholders to have their voices consistently heard within their state. Next slide. Thank you. So I'm not going to dive too far into the California efforts since um, some of the amazing folks who have been directly involved with these efforts for years are going to dive a little bit deeper into what those have looked like. But because of the hard work of California rare disease advocates, Back in 2021, a bill was introduced to establish an RDAC in the state. However, it was vetoed um, since Governor Newsom requested that it do go through the budget process, which has been kind of a work in progress. So my former counterpart uh, did an incredible job with assisting with building a strong coalition of stakeholders and advocates in California that continue to work hard to establish an RDAC. So the role of a coalition when it comes to RDAC advocacy efforts is to consistently work the diverse group um, together to strategize on how to support the efforts, to share different updates with one another, and to work to the best of our ability to make sure that an RDAC will meet the unique needs of California residents. Um, so the meetings are completely open to the public and we'd love to continue growing this coalition so even after an RDAC hopefully gets across the finish line, um, these coalition members often work together to make sure that it gets off the ground and that it's a true success. So please reach out um, if you're interested in joining these efforts. Okay, thank you. Um, so I wanna also do an overview of some of the work that NORD has been doing to support state RDAC efforts. So we really wanna continue increasing the number of RDACs throughout the country and to continue to work to strengthen existing RDACs to give as many rare disease uh, advocates a voice in state government as possible. To date, 24 states have signed RDAC legislation into law and NORD has worked to develop state-based RDAC coalitions, which is the one I mentioned, in California to support and provide opportunities that encourage RDAC collaboration. 
So NORD highly encourages um, that different state RDACs collaborate with one another to share ideas and best practices. Uh, we plan to continue to develop and release different toolkits and one pagers, host webinars, and convene additional meetings to support RDACs with their ongoing work. So it isn't uncommon for newer RDACs to ask for support as they uh, get off the ground. So we really do what we can to make sure that a successful implementation process occurs and um, that it's communicated. So um, Nord also, we really like to check in with the existing RDACs to learn about some of their work um, and to check in to see what additional resources are gonna be beneficial um, to continue strengthening them. So our team has most recently discussed creating a policy engagement toolkit for them. So it can definitely be overwhelming for um, a state to say, hey, we have an RDAC in place, but where do we start? So it's been really helpful to have more established and experienced ones um, make sure that the newer ones are able to get off the ground with their guidance and, and support, which has been really helpful. Okay. Thank you. So as mentioned, 24 states have signed RDAC legislation into law. Arkansas, Delaware, Iowa, Indiana, Oregon, Maryland, Michigan, South Dakota, Texas, and Washington all have pending RDAC legislation. Uh, so 2023 is already a really exciting and busy year for RDAC establishments. So I wanted to quickly share a few things that other state RDACs have done. For instance, New Hampshire, Pennsylvania, and Minnesota have worked on patient surveys. So after their RDAC um, passed, they worked to get these surveys out to their communities to assess their needs, um, what's really impacting them, and what they could, they'd like to see an RDAC work on. Uh, North Carolina worked to improve their state's newborn screening program, and they've put out a white paper on different issues that impact their community. Um, and we've also seen them give a lot of guidance to their state legislature um, on how to improve various issues that they face. So those are just a few specific um, things that we've seen other RDACs focus on um, and they continue to grow and, and evolve and do additional um, great work that we like to share out when we can. So RDACs have typically convened the public also to hear from them directly um, so it's not just the members of these councils that are able to share concerns and their stories. A lot of these meetings are open to the public, so it's a consistent resource for people throughout the state to connect with their community um, and share their story and the needs that they'd like to see addressed. So they also, um, a lot of them really work to consult with experts in the rare disease space um, to improve access and quality to issues related to things like health insurance, education, and treatment, um, and working to make additional recommendations um, on state agencies and to the legislature um, about their community. So several councils have also listed uh, publicly available resources on their state's websites. So although RDACs um, have similar missions, they're really a bit unique from one another to ensure that they truly cater to their state's rare disease community um, to the best of their ability. Perfect. Great, so that is kind of a snippet of some of the work that we've seen other RDACs do um, and the importance. And we're really hoping that California is gonna be the, the 25th state to have one. So thank you all for your hard work and happy to um, loop anyone who's interested into these efforts as well. Thank you, Anissa. And for everybody here, we're gonna work our way through all the presentations and then we will have a collective Q&A time. Uh, so thank you, Anissa. Next, we have uh, Dr. Doctor Who, because yes, he does have his PhD uh, <laughs> in molecular genetics and microbiology, but we uh, will just call him Mike for today. Mike is a parent of two children with a rare disorder. He's an advocate for newborn screening and efforts to bridge the gap between advanced technologies and expansion of newborn screening programs. Mike is the co-founder of Project Guardian, a nonprofit organization that seeks to advance genomics-based newborn screening. He has many other roles, and I hope you can read more about him in his bio. But with that, I'll turn it over to you. Welcome, Mike. 
Thanks, Siri. Uh, and yes, please do continue to call me Mike. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. My name is Mike. Uh, I was trained as a molecular geneticist, and uh, I want to give you a little bit of uh, our story first and tell you why I turned my attention to uh, helping set up an RDAC and why that is going to be so critical for the rare disease community in California. Um, so after my training, I started my career as a genomic testing tool developer, and then later on as a diagnostic test tool developer. And uh, a little over 10 years ago in 2011, um, my world changed uh, due to my kid's diagnosis. And it initially, it started as a journey like so many other rare disease families. We have symptoms uh, with our older uh, boy at the time, uh, he's three and a half, but there is no clear diagnosis any one doctor can make. So we've seen a slew of specialists uh, and to, towards the end of that six months journey, we finally got to a geneticist office and got the diagnosis. And I have to say six months compared to a lot of the rare disease families is actually pretty short, especially after getting into the field, I have gotten to know so many diagnostic odysseys that went way wrong and way longer. And you know, you, you sometimes hear uh, them going on for decades and even decades without a resolution at the end, right? So um, nonetheless, six months feels too much pain to a, a parent who had suffering kids and no answers, right? So I think one of the critical things at that time that was planted in my mind is, how can we shorten that? And long story short, after the old, older one was diagnosed, um, we diagnosed a younger one as well, because we have to test for him. And he wasn't presenting any symptoms at the time. He was one year old. And so they both started treatment. We were, so the disease my boys have is called Hunter syndrome or uh, mucopolysaccharidosis type two or MPS2. It's one of the five to 10% uh, luckier ones that have a, an FDA approved treatment. But as Siri has alluded to earlier, these treatments similar to many others are more for slowing down the progression. They're not a cure. So in, in this particular disease, the boy's body lacks a critical enzyme uh, due to a mutation. And so without this enzyme, essentially some waste molecules in their body will start to accumulate uh, in a small uh, organelle within the cell called the lysosome. And these molecules, waste molecules themselves are toxic. They cause various kinds of issues. And because they accumulate so much in the lysosome over time, it's progressive in the sense that these waste molecules keep being generated and there's no way to recycle them now. So eventually they push the cells out of function and cause uh, uh, physical uh, damages to the organs. Uh, they cause developmental delay in the brain uh, and a whole slew of other issues. So it's a systemic disease. <clears throat> so the therapy is replacing the enzyme essentially through weekly infusions. And uh, these are, I think on one end, we're lucky to have a treatment. On the other end, we're not lucky to have a form of treatment that is very taxing. It's uh, every week you have to go to the hospital, stay there for close to a day to see the, <clears throat> uh, the very necessary enzyme drug slowly trickling into their veins through uh, infusion. And so over the years, we've uh, made a small calculation. The boys have actually stayed in the hospital for about 15% of their life. In addition to the infusions, of course, because it's a systemic disease, all parts of their bodies have to be regularly monitored uh, by specialist visits and measured. And there's a whole slew of uh, <clears throat> visits that we have to plan on an annual basis. Uh, and in addition, because the therapy is not a cure, uh, we enrolled the boys in clinical trials, and those are very time demanding as well. What got me interested in newborn screening 
uh, was, as I mentioned earlier, we I got it planted in my brain that we need to figure out a way to uh, shorten the diagnostic odyssey. And on top of that, what we have seen between the two boys who one was diagnosed at an older age, started treatment when he's very symptomatic already, versus the younger one who doesn't have a lot of symptoms, virtually not uh, presenting at the moment, younger and started treatment at that age before a lot of damages are done. During the 10 plus years of uh, disease course, it's very apparent that the younger one had always had better outcomes, both physically and developmentally. At the age of eight, uh, that was about his peak of development. Uh, he was able to put together puzzle pieces, there are 300 pieces uh, altogether, and that was impressive. Uh, I have to admit, I'm not a puzzle expert, looking at 300 pieces of puzzles lying on the floor is a headache to me, but he was able to sit down for over two and a half hours to make that. And it's impressive, not just because he can make the puzzle, but because of the focus he landed to this activity. Hunter boys are known to be hyperactive and they don't sit around for five minutes. So uh, I think that shows you how much he had achieved in his milestones, whereas my older one, unfortunately, he never eclipsed the development age of about two and a half to three, and he's been declining ever since. Uh, and so, you know, it, with that kind of presentation of symptoms to us, the natural question to ask is, how can we diagnose early and how early can we diagnose of these symptoms? Um, and so newborn screening came to my eyes partially because of my genetics background. I, I'd always think, you know, with genetic diseases, if you can sequence them, there's a chance to find them early. Uh, and our existing newborn screening system uh, provides a great backbone for that. Um, but at the moment, we are not screening genetically widely for a lot more diseases that can be screened for yet. So I co-founded, I left my full-time job in 2018, co-founded a Nonprofit organization called Project Guardian, short for Genomic Uniform Screening Against Red Diseases in All Newborns. Uh, we hope to transform the newborn screening system in the United States and bring it into the genomic age because we know genomics testing can bring so many more diseases into the spotlight, shorten the diagnostic odysseys that are so painful to families, and have better outcomes for the babies that are identified earlier. For that reason, I have been a newborn screening researcher for the past five years. And along that journey, I got to know the Rare Disease Advisory Council work, uh, partially because of my stint at Nord as a volunteer state ambassador. Um, we're gonna hear a lot more about RDAX later on, uh, but I just want to give you an example of how an RDAX in the uh, state of California can help the Rare Disease community based on our own experience. And this is one of many examples I can pull. <clears throat> so I've told you already about the, the boys' uh, challenges that they have faced. At the age of uh, close to four, when my oldest one was diagnosed, uh, he uh, was already very delayed. And so one of the things we were told that we can uh, go check out are resources from the regional center. And so we applied, uh, but he didn't get in until two rounds of applications later. And for those of you who are not that familiar yet with regional center, I'm sure it will come into play at some point. Um, regional center admission is based on a, a review that has five categories of eligibility. So there's uh, autism, there's intellectual disability diagnosis, there is uh, cerebral palsy, there is epilepsy, and then there's everything else. Now, I have to say, I think that system itself is working great for most people, as for the first four categories, it made the process really streamlined to, for, for those families to get care and get support that they needed. But unfortunately for rare disease families who pretty much all fall into the fifth category, there's no straight line of access. 
Uh, and because MPS2 is a rare disease, no one at the regional center has heard of it, of course. And so they have to do their own research, rely on their own resources to get into what is it? What does it mean? We have you know, nurse visits to our home to see uh, how the boys are doing and are they eligible? And at the end of the day, <clears throat> for our older one, who clearly should have been uh, eligible from the get-go, he didn't get in until a year and a half later. And what's worse is for our younger one, uh, who, when we started ap applying for him, he was at the age of uh, about three. As I mentioned, his function was a lot better than his elder brother. And he appeared to be a lot more typical developing, even though we know he's delayed. And with the boys sharing the same mutation, we know their uh, uh, expected outcome eventually is going to be uh, very similar and similarly severe, which is unfortunately proven to be true after 10 years. Uh, but at the time, he still appeared to be very vibrant. For him, we had to go through three rounds of application and an appeal. We almost went to court before it was resolved. And it was resolved for uh, kind of a, a incidental meeting with the regional center's director at the time. I would say, well, when we finally get to met with her, she preparing that meeting had a stack of paper in front of her. Those were all the files that we have provided over the years for the two boys, right? And the first sentence she told us was, I think your boys should be in regional center from the get go. But the problem is we have a system that is unfamiliar with rare diseases like Hunter syndrome. And so all the troubles that we have gone through over a span of close to three years to get the support that regional center provides uh, has shown that if we can somehow streamline that, we can give more insights to any state agencies like the regional center that needs to know these from a, you know, a, a resource that they trust and uh, be able to consult with the rare disease community directly. I think that will provide so much more value to the families who need those help. I will stop there and uh, we are going to hear a lot more about RDAX in other ways that uh, can be helpful to the rare disease community. And if you have any questions, I will surely hang around at the Q&A to answer them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mike, for sharing your personal story. I'm so moved every time I hear about that and just the the, knowledge that early intervention can change so much um, for people with rare diseases. So thank you. And I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions that we will circle back to. Uh, but for now, we'll keep moving forward. And next we have Adrian Shapiro uh, with us. Adrian is a co-founder and the science administrator for Access Advocacy, an organization supporting work to cure sickle cell disease. She is the fourth generation of mothers in her family to have a child born with sickle cell disease. And she was an early supporter of work with bone marrow transplants and later, and still a tremendous advocate for stem cell research. Uh, welcome, Adrian. You are muted, Adrian. You're not unmuting me, okay. Everybody on this commit on this that you're seeing now is used to my uh, great how can I say, computing skills. <laughs> so I'm very sorry. I thought I was unmuted. Um, so uh, yeah, so I am actually fifth generation of mothers in my family to have a child with sickle cell. When I first started my journey, uh, we thought I was the third. And I'm telling you this because, um, it's one of the reasons that having um, the, um, the RDAT so important, right? Um, my daughter, uh, or I guess my journey began at birth with sickle. My older brother had it. My um, mom was a stay-at-home mom. 
Um, my brother at that time, um, he had a stroke at three that left him physically and mentally handicapped. And um, even though sickle cell is a, is, is a, a blood disorder, right? That takes their cells, the blood cells from being round and, and bouncy to this, uh, once they release their oxygen to the sickle shape, which causes immense pain and uh, blockages uh, throughout the entire body. Um, and it resulted in a stroke for him. He, um, at that time, the doctors recommended that my mother basically put him in an institution. And that's what was done with children who were different then. You didn't, you didn't, you, you just didn't keep those children. And my mom was like, oh no, <laughs> he's ours, we're keeping him. And um, I, I remember going with her to the doctor appointments with my brother and it would just be my mom. And when they let me in myself and my brother and the doctor and sometimes the nurse. And I remember thinking about how and feeling how sad it was and how alone my mother was. And my mom was really into, she's a very faithful woman, but she also believed in science. And her quote was always, God is good, but science is going to fix this. And that is what um, was just embedded in me. So although sickle um, up until the 70s, I guess the 60s, had dire um, life expectancy for the children, right? It was like sickle everywhere else in the world. There are millions of people with sickle in the world. Um, here in America, there are 100,000 of us. That makes us the largest rare disease. Um, but it's very, very, it's still very rare. Um, how can I put this? Her belief as a mother and embracing and loving her children and loving even her imperfect child um, really is what allowed me as a mother not only to embrace mine, but to recognize that sort of devotion and belief that I see in all the other rare moms that I meet now. And although I'm not gonna share a lot about the specifics of our disease odyssey because they've known about it for over 120 years. We've been very fortunate uh, within the last five years to get three new treatments. And we are actually going to the FDA with a gene and cell therapy uh, cure. But I'm gonna share one reason why the RDAC is so important. I started um, going to visit state legislators as, as I had to learn, how do you help? How do you fix? How do you get answers, right? How do you get better medicine? How do you get education? How do you get um, people the things that they need that aren't as, um, I'm gonna say well off as others. And so they said, you become an advocate and you go and you see your state legislators. I'm like, okay, uh, you know, I can show up. Uh, so I remember going and we drove for hours, you know, and I don't like cars. I have to tell you that as a Californian, I don't like cars. I know it's sacrilegious, but I don't like cars. But this was a really long drive. And I remember we got in and you know we were all very grateful to this legislator and we told him about this horrible disease and how much pain and how our babies were put on on opioids before they were 2 years old right and showed him documentation about how awful it was and how how they their organs were being destroyed and their brains and everything and how we needed help and he looked at me straight and said, well, you know, I mean, you know, there's not that many of you. I mean, it's not like diabetes. It's not like, you know, and I remember looking at him and thinking, 
Oh, actually, I think I said to him, I said, well, how could you even say that? Who would wish anything like this on anybody? Let known, I mean, like more of us. And so that was my journey. I was going, I got involved. I said, okay, I'll figure this out. Who's, who, who can make it better? And I've knocked on doors and for years and years and years gone through that. But it wasn't until I got into stem cell work that I was exposed to other mothers outside of my disease, outside of sickle. And I remember being in that first meeting and hearing these stories. And I'm like, oh my God, if this, these mothers can get up and stand up after losing their child. I mean, my mother's nightmare, mine that I had lived with, these mothers had, had one mother, she had lost three kids, her husband, and was facing losing a fourth child. And she stood up in front of this huge room of people and told her story. And I thought, my God, if this woman can do it, you know, I can do it and we can all do it together. And so what the RDAC is going to do, everybody's going to give you some more points, but I'm going to tell you what the RDAC is going to do for me. It is never, ever going to allow any legislator, any body in power look at another group and say I wish there were more of you we're going to show up and show them exactly how many of us there are and what our community is we are valuable we we have lives we contribute we 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 are rare, right? And we're mighty. And so if we can do this in California and do it well, like California does most things well, then that vision of mine, and I'm sure all of yours can come true. And um, yeah, so... Um, thanks for listening to my story and I really hope you'll join us and a lot of my predictions come true. <laughs> I predict we're going to have this and it's going to help all of us and um, standing together, standing together with that mother and that father heart and not letting political parties or political ideologies, or history of the way things were always done, or medical community separate us by disease. Because we're all human, and we're all wanting the best for our children and our lives. And together, together, we're going to do this. And so I'm going to hand it back to Siri now. Adrian, thank you so much for sharing your story. And I have to say, I just loved when you uh, commented about what can I do? I can show up. I think that is just the key for everybody to embrace. Just you can show up and together we really are strong. Even if your disease group has seven identified cases together, we have a very strong voice. So thank you so much. So now we're going to move to our next presenter, Stacy Ravellis. Stacy is the mother of three children, one of whom lives with cystic fibrosis or CF. Stacy is the Advocacy and Programs Associate at CFRI, the Cystic Fibrosis Research Institute. And she came to CFRI with previous advocacy experience in Sacramento through her work for a California Senator. And we're so glad you're part of CFRI's team now, Stacy. I'll turn it to you. I am very honored to be a part of CFRI. I am also very honored to be a part of the RDAC Coalition. So one of my favorite things in life, um, it was uh, also before my daughter was diagnosed, but it just became incredibly even more meaningful uh, just to push on that mountain, 
And if one person is pushing on the mountain, then you know that's that's small and mighty. But if two people, two hundred people, like it's when we get together and you know those boots on the ground and we are working together for one cause instead of separating all of our diseases. I really I have seen just in the last six seven years since my daughter's been diagnosed. Uh, the conversation is changing in rare disease communities. We are banding together and we are uh, we are strong on our own, as strong as we can be. But when you find people in your community, you become stronger. You're not alone. And then when you take all of those groups, you know, and we are all working together, it's just uh, it's been amazing to watch this. And we're only at the beginning. So um, cystic fibrosis, I know Siri has already mentioned what it is, uh, definitely known as a lung disease, um, but it is very systemic. Um, most people have pancreatic insufficiency. Uh, many have cystic fibrosis related diabetes, infertility. Uh, a lot of times the GI issues are, you know, they create the barriers to the quality of life, even though it's known as a lung disease. Um, my daughter, Megan, um, is our youngest child. And we would have caught her diagnosis um, if she were born just a few weeks later. So ironically, uh, CF was added to California's newborn screening test, um, although there are over 2,000 known disease-causing genes. So very few of those genes um, are on the newborn screening. And I have one of the more common genes. Um, that one uh, she has, and she would have been caught uh, at at birth. And I wish we had known. So by the time we did finally you know, receive the diagnosis, she was nine and a half, um, and she was pretty sick and had lost lung function. And it was it flipped our world upside down because the entire time, um, and it is progressive. I watched it progress in her life. Uh, so by the time she was in grade school and, you know, on soccer teams and, um, you know, in the drama, you know, for her, her school plays, uh, she ran all over that soccer field. Um, she was always the first at the top, you know, of our day hikes, uh, even though she had low lung function and she was, you know, she had two different pathogens that were um, uh, cultured in her lungs. Um, but it was her GI issues that would pull her over and she just would stop. So um, all of those symptoms, they just didn't look like anything outside of allergies and asthma or, you know, maybe she's lactose intolerant. I mean, they just kept pushing us out the door. Like, would you stop worrying? I knew something was wrong over time. And you know what broke my heart is that my daughter knew, you know, so I remember her yelling at me. I'm trying to give her a, a different asthma medication. Um, none of them ever work. And she yelled at me in the kitchen and she just said, you know, why? Why are you giving me all these medications? Nothing works. What is wrong with me? And for a, a young child to even know that, you know, you, the guilt, like I'm not doing enough. I don't know the right question. I can't find the right doctor to pay attention to her. So our diagnostic odyssey was um, nine and a half years. And uh, we also are ex extremely passionate, like uh, Mike's story as well, about uh, newborn screening and access, access to genetic testing and genetic counseling so that all of these genes that are gonna get missed, um, you know, that these families, every family has an opportunity to receive care. Um, so I, uh, again, am very honored to be here with CFRI and be here with you um, advocating for a rare disease advisory council. We need to be at the government's table. So it had, we, have under, we understand that it's been said that um, maybe we should just be publicly funded and we vehemently disagree. So we need a place at the government's table. First of all, it just, places even more burden on the rare disease community's shoulders. So now we also have to fund ourselves to have a voice. So no, uh, we need to be at the government's table. Um, 
it also just makes sense. Better organization and understanding just gives rise to opportunities to, you know, for streamlining, um, as we've discussed, and uh, to speed the process, uh, which is really important, especially when it comes to saving lives, um, quality of life also. Uh, and, you know, with the government, it's always about the bottom line. It can also save, you know, costs. Um, but the information gleaned from the rare disease community uh, just also directly assist the general population. I wish they would take a moment and, and think about that. For example, this is way too easy, but uh, mRNA therapy, rare disease community, we've been watching that, you know, for decades. And all of a sudden, you know, uh, the, we're all uh, experiencing COVID and the COVID vaccine popped up pretty fast. No, it wasn't fast. It's that science has been around for a long time. So uh, I just, I feel like that's also uh, misunderstood that because we're rare, it doesn't apply, you know, to the general population. And that is just not true. We also know a lot of medications um, where are geared to, you know, for one outcome, but it ends up, you know, treating something else. So there's a lot of accidental discoveries as well. Um, the rare disease voice, just bringing that to the table. Um, again, opportunity for just a better understanding of challenges within the healthcare systems. Um, just basically identifying areas where improvements can be made that, you know, it benefits us all, not just the rare disease community. Uh, also increases that access to the approved medications and therapies. Sometimes, you know, people don't know that there is anything out there for them because they don't have the diagnosis, they don't have the education, and it's just missed opportunities. Um, sharing the patient stories. We're hearing, you know, a lot of wonderful patient stories right here today, and that is uh, the most important way to start conversations. Um, but to bring the patient story uh, to legislation, just to help consider ways for improving outcomes um, in the medical student community, clinicians, patients, patient organizations, and we just keep that conversation going, but we need a place to start. Uh, eventually, we see an RDAC uh, becoming a, a, a wonderful resource for families just in need of answers. Um, we need to get it off the ground, uh, but that is definitely um, you know, very close to all of our hearts. Um, and it also just reduces the burden of families living with rare diseases and that we do have a voice, we do have a place to start. So um, the National Economic Burden of Rare Disease Study was uh, recently done by the Every Life Foundation for Rare Diseases. So in discussing the cost of uh, rare disease, um, when we hear things like there's not enough of you or you know, there's uh, the cost of such a small population, it's too much for too few, um, this study really helps uh, ensure that um, our experience is reflected accurately in policy discussions. Um, this is the very first of its kind. Uh, it was done to raise awareness um, you know, of the cost, but it only included uh, 379 rare diseases. Um, and that alone in one year in 2019, so it's a snapshot of one year, 379 rare diseases, and the cost reached nearly $1 trillion in the United States. So the cost of not having a diagnosis and access to care, um, which is what an RDAC would help you know, create opportunities to increase those, um, you know, the access to newborn screening, genetic testing. Um, so it is uh, important that we understand the cost of not being organized and, and not having access um, as well. So this uh, uh, disease did include direct medical costs, just using claims data, um, like inpatient, outpatient care, physician's visits, uh, medications, um, and durable med medical equipment. Also, um, 
it was designed to collect indirect and non-medical costs, which we all know are an enormous part of the rare disease community, like forced retirement, missed work. And this was not quantifiable, but also missed opportunities for growth in careers, not just for caregivers, but for those living with rare diseases as well. Um, also out-of-pocket costs were um, included here uh, just for home and auto modifications, um, transportation, education, and paid home care, which oftentimes is daily, you know, needed daily. And uh, nutrition, you know, a lot of times just uh, the special nutrition needs uh, for your, your family in the rare disease community. Um, so the cost of the diagnostic odyssey, obviously not included here, um, but just a greater cost. It, all of those visits that my daughter went to, you know, um, were essentially not needed. You know, we, we could have been um, uh, caring for her correctly for nine and a half years. Uh, so I definitely wanted to bring up um, the cost of missing opportunities for uh, a diagnosis as well. Um, and I know with legislation, a lot of times it is just like there's a sticker shock. So you hear how much it's going to cost, you know, for sickle cell treatment, for cystic fibrosis treatment, for um, uh, for what it's worth. Uh, yeah, it's going to be expensive. But I think another way that an RDAC would help uh, in California is to create a better understanding of the back end costs that can be saved by you know, in understanding and investing in those front end costs. And in the cystic fibrosis community, um, we are fortunate we have a therapy that has been recently approved. Um, it is also not a cure, uh, just like Mike's story, um, but the cost is $312,000 a year. And I had my own sticker shock. <laughs> um, I think we all do, but, um, Without this, and this is only one of many medications for uh, those living with cystic fibrosis. But without this medication, if you are eligible for it and you are not able to take it, uh, then we're back to you know the two to four breathing treatments and all of the medications that that, that requires uh, every day. Not to mention the time; it's about an hour per breathing treatment. Um, but also the you know rare disease. I'm sorry, the uh, cystic fibrosis related diabetes. Um, it's Trikapta is the name of the medication that I'm talking about. A lot of people are finding that they don't need, um, you know, their medication for the, the um, uh, oh my goodness, um, I just lost my train of thought. The Oh my goodness, uh, the diabetes, excuse me. Um, uh, the, continuing on, the uh, hospital visits are normal. Uh, it's par for the course in the CF world. We come in for a tune-up for about two weeks and that can happen several times a year um, or every few years, depending on what you're culturing and uh, how low your lung function is. And then finally procedures, sinus surgeries, bronchoscopies, um, and ultimately organ transplantation, which is a major surgery and has lifelong medical issues associated with that. So um, we really believe that everybody deserves um, access and the ability to receive a diagnosis, the education regarding their health, and the ability to receive the care they need to receive their best life. So in a rare disease advisory council, this is the work that we would be doing um, in bringing this to the state of California and, and all of the residents that in, in it. Thank you so much, Stacy. And again, I think that is the key thing to keep pointing out. I mean, the cost of the diagnostic journey, all the testing, all the permanent um, consequences of not having a diagnosis, you know, as Mike shared, and for your own daughter and that the early intervention is obviously the most important thing just because it's humane, it's quality of life, it's all that. 
But it also, if people need to look at this as a financial issue, it is extremely costly to not have a diagnosis. And then in turn, um, the savings, once you do have some kind of intervention um, for all the other complications of these many, many rare diseases. So thank you so much for bringing that up. And then our final speaker today before we have a Q&A is Jacob Fraker. I've had the honor of working with Jacob for many years. Jacob is a legislative aide for California State Senator Susan Eggman, where he serves as a legislative consultant for the California Legislative LGBTQ Caucus. Jacob has a master's degree in social welfare and through his role in Sacramento, Jacob has played a pivotal role in advancing both cystic fibrosis and rare disease awareness at the state level. Welcome, Jacob. Oop, we can't hear you. You're un it looks like you're unmuted, but. Can you hear me now? Perfect, yes. Okay, there's always gotta be one technical glitch. We've had a few today, so, but we're all getting one. I, I had it covered, Jacob, with my slides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Better than a brain blip. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll see, my, I, haven't, I haven't finished speaking yet, so I might solve one of those. Uh, wonderful to, to be here and, and to talk to you all. Thank you, Sierra, for the introduction. It's been really wonderful um, to, to listen uh, to some of these incredible panelists who I've had you know, the absolute honor to work with uh, these past few years as we've tried to get uh, an RDAC here in California. So uh, I'm going to just kind of give a, a brief overview of kind of, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of questions about like, why hasn't California had an RDAC yet? And so I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the efforts of this incredible group on the call today and, and some of what we're kind of planning for for the future. Uh, so I, I think it's fitting that the RDAC, uh, it's kind of what we've done here in California. Um, it has had its own little odyssey, uh, very similar to uh, many rare disease patients. So this uh, kind of journey began in, in 2019. So uh, going on five years now. Um, and in, in 2019, uh, then Assembly Member Maine Shine uh, put forward a bill to put uh, the RDAC forward. Uh, it was a very kind of a, a smaller version of what, uh, you know, Anise alluded to in, in SB 247. Uh, but this was kind of our first foyer into this and trying to see what we could do, try to get this to move forward. Uh, that bill did not get out of assembly probes. There was some conflict between, you know, the advocates and, and the member trying to kind of figure out how best to move this forward. And they couldn't quite come to a consensus. And so it kind of got parked at assembly of probes. Uh, the next year, uh, then Assembly Member Susan Aikman, my current boss, ran the bill. Uh, but as we all know, 2020 had different plans for all of us. Uh, and so this bill kind of got put on hold along with, with most things. I think probably 80 to 90% of bills in the California state legislators got slashed uh, that year. Uh, normally, members can carry anywhere from 20 to 25 bills. And we were told uh, sh shortly after all those introductions that each member could pick three. Um, and so, you know, this was a bill that we realized it just, we, we didn't have the capacity to do at that time. Uh, and so in 2021, when my boss uh, won her Senate race and became state senator, Susan Aikman, uh, it was one of the very first bills that we introduced. Uh, we acknowledge the importance of this. Um, you know, I myself, uh, as, as someone with cystic fibrosis, my brother has cystic fibrosis. The senator herself has had family members that have experienced issues with rare diseases, really acknowledge the importance of having an RDAC here in California. And so it was one of the very first bills that we introduced in 2021. That bill was very successful in a legislator. Uh, we flew through a policy and appropriations committee, uh, and we got that bill all the way to the governor's desk, which in and of itself is a huge success uh, that would not have been possible without the people on this panel. And so, you know, the, the, the need was there, right? The, the understanding of the need was there from the state legislator. Uh, and unfortunately, when it came time uh, for signature, the governor needed some uh, veto that piece of legislation, indicating that he felt uh, that because of the cost of a roughly six hundred to seven hundred thousand a year, um, that you know the bill would need to go through the budget process, um, and you know fiscal costs on bills are always kind of funky. I always question what kind of calculator they use when they add up some of these numbers, but uh, 
but part of that cost was because when when we came back in 2021 and this panel really took a look at the legislation that Assemblymember Mainstream had put forward and that we had kind of worked on in 2020, we wanted to make sure that, that the RDAC that we had here in California, given that uh, you know California is home to over 40 million uh, individuals, which is a, you know based on just the the 10 percent, likely four million individuals have rare diseases here in California. That we really wanted to make sure that, that this council was robust. This council worked to address uh, the issues of all rare diseases and not just some of the ones that folks may have heard of. Uh, you know, we really wanted to make sure that there was true representation on the council and that it would be able to really advance the issue of rare diseases uh, at a lot of different tables. Right, uh, because the, the reality is that because, and I think the economic impact study really speaks to it, all the different places where it's really important that rare disease folks have a seat at the table to be able to have a conversation. It's not just in drug development. It's not just in insurance coverage. Uh, it's in our schools. It's in our, you know, whether it's from elementary school to college and making sure that uh, children have an opportunity to, to access the care they need when they're at elementary school, when they're at high school, uh, but also to make sure that our medical professionals are getting the education they need uh, as they're going through medical school, uh, whether that's doctors, whether that's nurses, whether that's respiratory therapists, whether that's any profession to make sure they have some connection and understanding of rare diseases. And so that the need for that conversation is in a lot of different places. And so we've wanted to make sure that the council that we built out mm -hmm. reflected that. Um, that said, uh, you know, having a 7,000 plus person council probably would not be super workable. Uh, and so we really went to the, to the, you know, the drawing board and said, okay, you know, where can we, you know, build capacity uh, without creating some unworkable, you know, monstrous council. And I think that this group, in, in concert with a lot of other uh, rare disease organizations, we had, you know, a support list probably a mile wide in terms of organizations that came on to support this bill. We worked with all of them, uh, along with medical professionals, along with researchers and, you know, pharma and, and everybody who we feel needs to be at that table to really come up with what we thought was a very comprehensive list, um, but also a very strategic list uh, of who we felt could be there at the conversation, maybe at the table to be able to have that nuanced conversation of what it means to advocate for the rare disease community. Uh, and we really, you know, I know that there's certainly some questions about, you know, who should have, you know, who should be funding these types of things, right? Whether it's the state or other organizations, and we'll could certainly talk about that later, but, you know, what we were really mindful of in building out this legislation is that it was patient-focused, patient-centered. Uh, and often, I think, as many advocates in the rare disease and other spaces can attest, is that so much of this work is bored by unpaid uh, patients or you know folks in the community who are saying who are having to fight just to survive, right? And, and uh, this coalition and, and certainly the senator's office pushed back on that to say that no, we are not going to ask patients to you know come together to create their own situation. We're not going to pay them. We're not going to support them, and they're going to figure it out. And yeah, maybe we'll give them a, an opportunity to speak. No. We wanted state investment. We wanted the state to say that they have a role to play, that they have, uh, you know, need to have some skin in the game as we talk about some of these really dicey issues uh, and really difficult issues for many families. Uh, and so that's why we certainly supported, you know, having a state investment in this uh, and having, uh, you know, what we figured out through the department, right, of putting in the Department of Public Health, ha having staff, state staff attached to our council in order to, to do the research and, and other kind of support mechanisms to ensure that the, the labor was not bored by unpaid patients who are you know wanting to tell their story but shouldn't have to go through some laborious process or travel all over uh, unpaid to do that. Um, so, but because of that cost, right, Senator Newsom or uh, Governor Newsom vetoed that piece of legislation and said, you know, you need to go through the budget process. Um, and so that is the process that we are undergoing now of saying, okay, if that is the case. If we need to go through the budget process, let's see how we go about doing that. Um, unfortunately, of course, the, the economic forecast for many states is, is a tough one uh, this year and likely for the next few years. And so, you know, this group has, has really kind of put their heads together to try to say, like, how do we... Uh, just because we have a deficit does not make this issue any less important. Uh, it doesn't mean that we put this on the on the back burner and say, well, I guess we wait for better economic times. 
um, because rare disease patients and families don't get to do that. Right when the, the bill comes in for their medication, when the bill comes in for their treatment, they don't get to say, oh yeah, I'm just having some bad economic time. So we'll have to circle back to this another time. Um, and so, you know, in respect of that, we're saying, no, we're gonna ask for this now. We think you should prioritize this now. We think uh, that there is money in the budget to, to make this happen. Uh, and so that is certainly what we're focused on this year. Right? And, and trying to be mindful of that and, and respect the fact that, you know, maybe we need to ask for a limited term council and, and work to come back in later years to expand that work, but at least getting our foot in the door, at least getting the work done, you know, and he spoke to some of the really great things that are coming out of other states uh, and their RDAX. And I think California can really play a leadership role here and yes. expanding on what it means to have an RDAC and what exactly an RDAC can do. Um, you know, we're really intent on, you know, there's a lot of services out there for rare disease folks that are, you know, supported by the state, uh, but they're often siloed. They're often not connected. Many individuals have no idea they even exist. Uh, the Genetically Handicapped People's Program, um, which is a terrible name uh, for the program, but we're working on that too. Uh, but, you know, that's a really incredible program that we have in here in California that if you asked, I think, the average rare disease family or patient, they would have no idea even existed. Most of the time when we have that conversation about GHPP, people are like, what is that? Wait, I can get that? I, I had no idea. Um, and so there's a, a, a real role here for the RDAC to play, not just in doing surveys and not just in posting resources, but really connecting state resources to patients and families uh, and really building robust pipelines. Um, and yes, it is really narrow and who is eligible. And that's a whole nother uh, issue that, that, that we have really worked on. Um, so, you know, there's a big role here. We're very excited about it. We're excited to put this forward again this year um, and very hopeful that we see more success this year than, than we have in the other years. But with the acknowledgement that even if we are not successful this year, we'll be back next year uh, because the issue is not going away. The issue is only getting worse. Uh, and as we better understand different rare diseases and better understand the issues of those families, the problem becomes a higher prioritization. So, you know, if anything, as time goes on, yes, some treatments are coming through, which have been really incredible, but uh, there's a whole new host of challenges and problems. Uh, when we look at the rare disease community as a whole, you know, many years ago, this was really kind of uh, an issue just for children. Um, but because of some of the work of the Orphan Drug Act, we are now seeing that this is a problem for adults. This is a problem for teenagers. This is a problem for young adults. This is a problem for adults. This is a problem for seniors. Um, and there's a whole new host of challenges that we uh, have not even had you know the opportunity to grapple with yet that are now coming up now. And so the, the need for an RDAC is more important now than ever. Um, so, you know, my office is still very committed to this issue, still very committed to, to doing what we can do uh, to get this set up in California and to be a leader in this space. Um, so thank you all for uh, talking. Happy to answer any questions that are related to, you know, how we got to where we are in terms of the legislative and budget pieces. Happy to speak to those. Um, but yeah, just a lot of gratitude and appreciation for uh, my incredible panelists and the opportunity to, to chat about this. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob, and we are so very grateful to Senator Eggman for her leadership, both when she was in the Assembly and now in the Senate, and extraordinarily grateful to you for really helping to bring the voice of the broader rare disease community uh, to her work and her legislation. So thank you so much uh, for sharing that. And uh, we do have time, a little bit of time, for some questions, and I guess um, I'm just going to hopefully our magic tech people will have all our panelists visible on screen for everybody who's attending. Um, Jacob, since you were just speaking, let's start with you and um, talk a little bit more about how the RDAC would be positioned to influence uh, key legislation that could have an impact on the rare disease community. Yeah, I think when we were looking at the language and uh, building this out, we really you know, in the language built out opportunities that kind of required the RDAC to engage. Uh, so, you know, the medical drug use review boards, uh, many folks, you know, it's some right kind of like arcane bureaucratic committee that no one's ever heard of. Uh, and yet they are the ones who set standards uh, and apply, you know, take 
what comes down from the FDA and apply it to like the state level kind of uh, the Medi-Cal and, and, and private insurers here in California to say, what are the dosage requirements? Who should be able to access this? At what, you know, what's the eligibility for this kind of medication? Um, and in the CF community, we had issues when this first, when uh, Trikafta, or I guess at the time it was probably Orcombi that came down, uh, that it made no sense. <laughs> you know, it was like they were only going to allow people who had lung function like above 80% to be able to have access to the medication, which makes no sense, uh, given that, you know, the, the only people who have 80% lung function in the CF community are like the children, we had children like before, you know, like the, the, the degree is, uh, the disease has progressed. And so we, built into the language that the, the RDAC has to be consulted on rare disease medications so that when the FDA, you know, hands down these breakthrough medications to the states to say, you know, here you go, you need to get this through Medi-Cal and get this applied, that those medical drug use review boards have to reach out to the RDAC to say, hey, does this make sense? Does this work? You know, can you take a look at our eligibility criteria? Can you look at our dosing requirements and provide some insight to make sure that that is applicable to your community? Uh, so that was a real, you know, institutional way that we could kind of build in the RDAC's advice. Um, there are, of course, other places as well in terms of how it can impact policy. We tasked the uh, RDAC with producing a report uh, to the state legislator. Uh, originally, this was every two years, and we're looking at maybe changing that to maybe every four years uh, to fit more with the budgeting cycle. Um, but so that legislators, right, are a lot of the work that uh, rare disease advocates do when they come to the Capitol. So much of it is just on the awareness piece that rarely do we have a lot of time to talk about the problems. Um, and so this would allow for you know, clear policy and budgetary solutions being delivered to the state legislator on a regular basis to say, here's problems and here are solutions and allow for advocates to be able to speak to those uh, and, and really be able to focus on their story and also speak to some solutions that are really backed by kind of the state institution to say that these are state approved best practices for approaching these issues. Um, but it also creates an, an, an other kind of, a, a, general advisory body, right? When we look at when we look at 2020 and we look at what happened uh, with the pandemic, uh, there was a lot of guidance coming down that was not informed uh, at all by the communities that it really was supposed to be serving, right? When we look at who was most susceptible to something like COVID, folks with uh, autoimmune issues, folks who are, you know, kind of already medically compromised, um, this, the RDAC would have given a lot of our public health leaders and our state leaders uh, a, a resource body to go to to say, do these make sense, right? Do these requirements, do these, you know, are we making sure that PPE is being delivered to the right folks? Do we have access to these other things? Um, along with a whole host of other issues, right? When we look at natural disasters that happen in the state and, and folks with durable medical equipment who need to keep medications refrigerated, who need to be able to access their, you know, durable medical equipment, where do they go to do that? How do they do that? Are they being, are, you know, these pop-up, you know, centers, self-help centers being, providing those resources. So there's a lot of places where we kind of built in kind of this institutional way for the Art Act to step in and provide advice so that the rare disease voice could be brought to a lot of different tables going on in the state. Uh, that's why we thought CDPH was a really great place as they're kind of the touch point for a lot of these issues, whether it was the COVID pandemic or whether it's some of these other um, issues, CDPH plays a major role. And so that's really where we felt it would do best and really work to build in uh, into the language, right? Folding that into the language so it becomes a requirement of the RDAC, which makes it harder for folks to say, oh, no, thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, we we appreciate your insight, but we don't No, It's going to, you know, they have a seat at that table uh, and are going to be required to be there. So that was something that we were really mindful in building the language. And, you know, it's interesting that you mentioned those are great examples about, especially in emergency, because if um, many, many disease groups, I'm sure were aware of this, the emergency procedures uh, during COVID when it came down to um, rationing, you know, durable health care, the respirators and such, there were extraordinarily discriminatory language embedded in those emergency procedures that impacted many people with chronic disease um, and disabilities. And so that was a great example there. And I know in the cystic fibrosis world, many people have this perception of it being a disease that only impacts people of European descent. And yet we know it impacts people of every race, every ethnicity. And yet there is uh, disparities continue because of this lack of awareness. And so I'm wondering, and this is uh, for the group, whoever wants to dive in first, 
how would an art act help in bringing more equity to healthcare uh, and, and societal support? So if somebody wants to jump in. So I can, I can take a crack at it from the research point of view. So the newborn screening research we are currently conducting using uh, genomic sequencing uh, fulfills a, a big hole in our understanding of genetics. And that is the genetic data that we have been accumulating in our database, are mostly from people of European descendants. And so, like you mentioned just now, we had misunderstandings of CF, of sickle cells in their prevalence among these different populations, only to find out later on, once we implement them into newborn screening, that other ethnicity groups are being affected as well. And it's only a matter of, and, and the biggest, uh, best example of that is SCID, which was thought to be more European centric uh, disease in the first place, only to find out that it's not because it doesn't happen to other ethnicity background people. It's because we're not detecting them, that's all. And so I think with an RDAC, uh, similar things are happening with rare disease groups that we are just unaware rather than not happening. Uh, and so with an RDAC, I think what we can do, uh, and, and you know, my own newborn screening research is a part of uh, the rare disease uh, research. Uh, and I think we can bring more of those issues to surface. We can only solve them once we know them, right? So that's, that's I think, the biggest first step we need to take. Anybody else want to jump in? I will say that um, I understand that it requires a level of trust as well. And I think only an, an RDAT could really come up with uh, you know, ways, ways to approach. So it's not just about throwing surveys out there and hoping you know, to catch a bunch of you know, uh, participants. I think uh, these things need to be carefully thought out with care and concern that we are aware of in our community. So, um, you know, I, I just feel like the conversation would be very different, um, you know, coming from a rare disease advisory council than, than outside of our communities when it, when it comes to sensitivities. And I just want to say, um, having Again, the benefit of having had newborn screening for so long and in certain places, um, and and the new treatments and everything. Um, how can I put that? I I think that we can't uh, we can't discount. Uh, I'm going to say cultural uh, competency. Um, Words matter, attitudes matter, um, biases, many, many biases we found, uh, people are, are just not even aware of, right? And so when people, biases, everybody thinks biases come in to play when people are thinking about doing bad things, but bias comes in when people are thinking about good things. And it can lean, as we found out with the opioid epidemic, it leans so far in one direction and, and leaves this wake of damage and, and literally pain in this condition um, in totally unexpected. And so I think having the rare community there, being able to, to guide and inform those people who affect our lives. Because when you're a rare person, <laughs> your life literally does depend on what happens to you at the point of care. I mean, or, or in some cases, what you're fed. I mean, just, just your life. And if people who are making decisions about what's available to you or not available to you are not aware of that, those things, right? Um, it's not just your genes, right? It is um, so many other factors. And 
again, it, we've got to break down the silos between the researchers, the care providers, the family, the, the legislators, all of us together form, right? This, I want to say, greater community. And if we are not coming forward and, and having those people making the decisions understand how their decisions impact us, right? And not giving them that up front. You would never, I think, well, software design, because I came from software, you would never, I mean, early on, they did design software without having an end user there. And they soon found out, oops, by the time they had to redo something the fifth or sixth or 10th time, we need to have everybody there to understand it. And so um, I think it will help us make advances. I think um, the other thing that we saw like uh, last week where they're actually now accepting things like natural histories as, as scientific proof of what a, a person goes through with a rare disease. It's giving us that parity that we have so been lacking. And there are gonna be biases, but if what we're implementing understands that, right? Uh, then we have the ability to, and the, the forethought to build some guardrails around that so that its negative impact is less. Well said. That's kind of a drop the mic moment. <laughs> and I see we are up against uh, the time, and I'm oh, sorry. I, no, nobody has prodded me about, you know, you need to wrap things up. Up, but I do know the session does end at one and to be respectful of everyone's time, I do want to thank this unbelievable panel, Mike, Stacy, Adrian, Jacob, Anissa, you have all brought so many perspectives to this broad issue of the ARDAC. And I, for those of you who are in attendance, we are trying to build the coalition. We want more patient advocacy groups to sign on. We will be finding a way for individuals who may not be associated with a specific organization, but to also gather your voices and help you engage with this issue. And I do not know if, you know, this will be the last humiliating test of my tech skills <laughs> to see if I can pull up one final slide. Let's see here. Can people, what do people see? Because I'm joining. Oh, do people, is it large on my screen? It's very oh. teeny. Yeah. Okay, we're going to stop the share and I'm going to try one more time. But here's the thing. If Anissa, you want to put your email into the chat box and Stacy, if you would put your email in the chat box, um, then it is so interesting that it is not. No, nope, we're just stopping there. The info will be in the chat box because we do want to move forward. This, you know, time is important. And as Jacob pointed out, you know, we have moved it down the line. We have then been faced with a no this year, um, but we are not going away. And in fact, every year we want to come back stronger until we do have a rare disease advisory council in California. We should be leading the way and we can do it with the support of everyone here. So I thank you so much, Family Voices. We thank you for the opportunity to share this information and I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Thank you all.